share screen and then this. Okay. This is it. Do you guys see my screen now? I do. Uh, okay, we perfect. see all of them. I don't know if you can switch it to. I'm going to switch it to presentation mode. Yes. There which you is go. this one, which is slideshow. You see this now? I do. You see one. Okay, perfect. You are up and running. Okay. I'm um, pardon me being a little bit late. Sorry, I was trying to get things set up. I like to be in person. I really don't like Zoom. I'm a movement specialist. I like to move around and at the same time talk to people. But thanks to COVID, things have changed. So I'm going to go through everything, but I want to, can we do a question and answer session at the end of this or no? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm more interested in answering some of your question because Parkinson's disease is a field that's constantly changing. Okay, so I'm going to go over some of the basic stuff and I'm going to skip over some of the earlier slides because I'm pretty sure most of you guys know this stuff. So I'm just going to start with Parkinson's disease. The age of incidence is mean age is about 65. Okay, um, the prevalence, it kind of affects men a little bit more than women. The, um, it's most likely idiopathic. 90% is about idiopathic. Idiopathic is a term that we use and most people don't know what it means. It means basically we don't know why it happens. About 10% is hereditary and those 10% has to do with the PARC1 and PARC2 genes. Okay, And then there's also other genetic factors which is predominant in the Italian and um, Italian and Greek people which are LARC1 and LARC2 genes. So I have a couple patients who actually have the genetic form, but the majority of form, the majority form that's out there is the is the idiopathic form, which means we really don't know why it happens. Sometimes they think it's due to exposure to substances. Like for example, it's very common in the people who've served in Vietnam War and were exposed to Agent Orange. Okay. There are many features of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is not only a disease of motor, it's also a disease of what we call like cognition, like mood. Uh, there's a lot of like even diet to uh, smell. There's a lot of different organ system that gets impacted when people have Parkinson's disease. We start with the motor ones because the motor ones make life a little bit more difficult, but many people can have uh, Parkinsonian signs or early premotor symptoms, they call it, up to a decade before the disease starts. For example, depression is one. Anxiety is another one that's very common. Constipation is also is known to precede the start of the disease for about a decade before the onset of actually any of the motor symptoms. So Parkinson's disease, I'm going to go through through these because I want to spend a little bit more time on the later medications. We have early motor symptoms, which a lot of people have resting tremors, slowness, and stiffness. And we have late motor symptoms, which happens five to 10 years after the onset of the disease, which has to do mainly with postural problems and instability. Okay. We also have non-motor symptoms, as I discussed, which sometimes get undermined. And there are new medications that are coming out for these non-motor symptoms because they've been ignored for a very long time. And the non-motor symptoms, hyposmia, hyposmia, which is lack of smell, fatigue, depression, REM behavior, difficulty falling asleep, and constipation. These can occur, as I mentioned, about a decade before the onset of the symptoms, okay? The psychiatric symptoms also is very important. People feel anxious. I have people come and tell me, oh my God, my life is completely normal. It's beautiful. I have everything I want, but I feel anxious all the time. This is not you. This is the disease because changes in dopamine regulation have to do with anxiety mood. You have to understand dopamine is a very primitive neurotransmitter. It's one of the first neurotransmitters that's created and it has a very important role in every aspect of brain function, mood, mood, like emotions, motor, mobility, digestion, even like taking pleasure out of things. So it's very, it's a very integral, like a neurotransmitter that connects everything. So non-motor symptoms can be anxiety, depression. You can have autonomic problems. Also, we can posture problems because dopamine also plays a role in adjusting the blood pressure and normalizing the blood pressure. Sialuria, drooling, urinary problems. Again, these are all a different organ system that dopamine plays a role in helping control it and regulate its function. And cognition is also, also very important. 
So this is a very quick neuroanatomy. Um, the basal ganglia is where the dopamine is created. This is substantial Niagara. This is where the dopamine is created. And it's very tiny area, but very powerful effect. And once this area dies out, you start developing symptoms of Parkinson's. It's about 80% of the area has to die before you actually develop Parkinson's disease, okay? Basal ganglia function is very complicated area, very very complicated. It has to control the fine motion. This is a slide I kind of tend to focus for the residents and my fellows. It has to do with movement and dopamine. It increases mobility. It increases the control of motor activities, okay? So fine motion like this, it's not only controlled by the front of the head, which is the cortex, it's also controlled by the basal ganglia that has these dopamine receptors because it takes more coordination to do fine motor than big major motions. So you need dopamine, you need basal ganglia, you need these cells to do more fine motor activity. Oh, sorry. And this is a beautiful slide. I like colors. I, this just shows me where and what things are released. And dopamine is controlled. Here, the dopamine is coming and affecting the nerve cells. Dopamine also is impacted by other agents, other neurotransmitters like amantadine, anticholinergic agents, and other stuff, and MAOBs. Um, these are other enzymes that regulate the entrance and work and function of dopamine. And this slide is important because how majority of the medications that we're using right now are actually due to the knowledge that we have of dopamine and other stuff that regulate dopamine production or regulation, okay? And we'll get to the other more complicated stuff down the line, which unfortunately it's so new, I don't have a slide on, but I will talk to you about it once we open the case to discussions, okay? The main and the most common agent used is carbidopa, levodopa. That's been out for over 40 years. If people have seen the movie with Robin William and Robert De Niro, it's, it's a very, very good movie. It's not an accurate depiction of Parkinson's disease. Please don't go see that movie and start thinking you're going to be like that. That's actually a rare form of Parkinsonism. So you have to understand, some people have Parkinson's disease, the idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is the more typical form of Parkinson's disease, which responds to medication. That movie focuses on von Economos encephalitis, which was an infection of the brain that caused a Parkinsonian symptoms. Those we call Parkinsonism. Okay, we don't call them Parkinson's disease because they don't tend to respond to medication and the prognosis is very poor. That is a viral illness that happens every hundred years. We haven't, thank goodness, had another outbreak. Well, we had COVID to be honest with you, but it wasn't like von Economos encephalitis. So that, that caused people to have encephalitis. It was an infection of the brain that caused Parkinsonian sign. Even they responded a little bit to carbidopa. So that, that really explores the evolution and coming of carbidopa. Carbidopa has been on the market for a while and it's been out for about 40 years and it's still the gold standard therapy, the best therapy. Then you have dopamine agonists. Dopamine agonists are primipexol or ropinolol that were created in a laboratory that look like carbidopa, but they're not as strong binding as carbidopa. And then you have other agents, selegiline and resegiline, which, is, which are MAOBs. Okay, these MAOBs, there's a typo here, MAOB inhibitors with an S. Um, these prevent the breakdown of the carbidopa, levodopa. And then you have entacapone, which is tolcapone or entacapone. Tolcapone is no longer available in the US, uh, but entacapone is. Entacapone is another agent that basically prevents the breakdown of carbidopa. So you have the main thing being carbidopa and all the other medication being adjuncts to develop the efficacy and prolong the efficacy of carbidopa, okay? These are a couple interesting new medications that are on the block. Amantadine, I don't know how many of you guys have had it. Amantadine is actually an antiviral agent that was noted to promote release of dopamine at the nerve synapse, so that's why they're being used. And beta blockers, which are your typical heart medications, are actually used for Parkinson's tremors because they tend to slow down the tremor. So sometimes some patients have good response to it. However, Parkinson's patients, because they have 
uh, low blood pressure to begin with, they sometimes don't do well with this. And there's a newer medication called Northera that we use for that, okay? And anticholinergics, there was a time that they believed that there was an imbalance between dopamine and the cholinergic system. So they were using anticholinergic medications with dopaminergic medications. However, now this is falling out of favor and it's usually mo it's mainly used in patients who have a psychiatric disorder that, for example, schizophrenia, who've been on dopamine blocking agents and develop Parkinsonism, which as I mentioned, it's Parkinson-like syndrome. It's using, it's being used mainly for those group of patients. This is a treatment guideline with the standard old medical therapy of what to give patients depending on the age, because the way we treat the younger patients is a little bit different than the little bit older patients. Like people like Michael J. Fox, who has juvenile onset Parkinson, they got it when they were young, they're, they're different. You start them with different medications than, than people who started at the typical age of 60 or 65, okay? I'm going through these because I wanna get more to the medications and the therapies. And then you have non-motor pharmacological therapies. These are some of the newer agents. Like for example, for nausea, everybody uses uh, like kind of like, um, let's see, Reglan or Zofran, but the best medication is Tigan. However, there's a shortage of Tigan now, which tells me that it might be more difficult to obtain Tigan and these Anti-nausea medications, by definition, were medications that block the dopamine, okay? Because your nausea receptor, which is in the back of your brain, uses dopamine to register the feeling of nausea, okay? So when you block the dopamine, people would not feel nauseous, okay? So they're dopamine blocking agents, very similar to anti-schizophrenic medications that also block dopamine. So these are no-nos when it comes to people who have Parkinson's disease. However, Tigan works through a different receptor, works through a serotonin pathway. So this was the best agent. However, some insurances don't, don't, don't approve it. And a lot of the Parkinson's patients do have nausea. Again, Tigan is good, but some insurances don't approve it. And there is a shortage right now in the US. So Tigan is one of the newer one. For the REM behavior disorders, clonazepam is good, melatonin is good. Clonazepam is an earlier generation of the benzodiazepine that, that has lower uh, risk of addiction and longer action. So I have a preference. Most of the movement specialists have a preference for that. And then for depression, basically I still like the standard older medication. The best one being bupropion, wellbutrin, which is highlighted in bold, because why? Every, my life resolves, revolves around dopamine. I'm the dopamine man, okay? Because, and actually it's true in every way, because right now I'm talking with you, I'm excited, I love what I do. Why? Because there's a lot of dopamine being released in my brain. Okay. And dopamine does that to you, makes you very happy. And I'm pro dopamine. So well, butrin is also not only works on the serotonin receptors, but also on the dopamine receptors. Okay. So this is a very quick overview of Parkinson's and for hallucinations, there have been newer medications, which we will discuss. This one is pivaracerin. Please do ignore this. I don't know why this happened. I was looking at the slides. Um, ignore the ADFS. It's called pivaracerin. I don't know why this happened. It's also called neoplasm. Okay. The oldest agent was clozapin or clozarel, which was not good for bone marrow. So we stopped giving that to the Parkinson's patient. Seroquel is still given. Okay. And pimivacerin, which is neoplasm, is the latest medication that's been out for the past two to three years which has some good efficacy. It's mixed. Some people have great efficacy, some people don't, but it's still, I kind of give people a mixture of the Seroquel, which is the safest anti-psychiatric medication that takes away the hallucinations in combination of pimivacerin. And then for mild cognitive impairment, donezepil is very good, memantin is very good, and some people use the Exelon patch, Exelon patch is also very good. That's a newer medication. I believe it's the same thing as rivastagmine that is used that's very good for cognition. And there are a couple of studies that actually say that donezepil improves mobility and gait. So I leave that to start a few years after the onset of symptoms or people who have mobility issues, okay? The other thing is orthostatic hypotension. This is a problem that you get from about 10 years down the line. 
the, 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 prior, the old medications was typically Florinef and Midodrine, okay, which was a steroid. Florinef is fluorocortisone, which is a steroid, which was not good in elderly who had already hormonal problems with because it caused too much water and salt intake and it would cause swelling. So some people didn't work well. If you were diabetic, this didn't work well. Midodrine was bad for people who had heart disease because it would cause vasoconstriction. And when you vasoconstrict, it puts extra pressure on the heart and it causes worsening of heart function in people who had heart failure. And most of patients with Parkinson's disease already have or may have other comorbidities because of their age, because most people have it or get it when they're 70s or 80. So the new medication that came out that's very good is droxidopa or Nothera. This works on, again, it's a dopamine molecule modulator that works at the vessels and it, and it relaxes the vessels and, but constrains the venules. So it actually increases the blood pressure without causing too much of um, pressure on the heart or the, the, uh, or the kidneys. Uh, for Cialuria, the latest, the best and the latest thing is, um, is the Botoxes that we have. Okay, which is myoblock, the clicopyrrolate, and the atropine are the older one. Atropine is actually used for eye. Ophthalmologists use it, but sometimes we use a couple drop under the tongue to prevent the secretions. But the best thing for Cialuria now that I've noticed is Botox, and the best one is right uh, is the is the beta variant of the Botox, which is myoblock. Okay, uh, which is very good. The um, Zeoman has also been recently approved by FDA and that works well too. There is no great answer. I try different things for different people and see what works well uh, for my patients, depending on their physiology, depends. Every, everyone, and I'm going on a tangent right now, but every Parkinson's patient is unique. Okay, so you can't have the same standard of practice for every patient. So you kind of, you have to know everything that's out there and you cater in basically a therapy to individual Parkinson's patients. So this is now we're getting to the different surgical stuff that is out there that is good for Parkinson's patient, depending on the stage. One is the brain stimulator. This is not very new, but it's growing because there is a latest, um, there is a, there is a latest form of lead that is, it's, it's not a typical lead. So there was one electrode with four contact points in the in before, but now they've noticed that if they break these contact points into different areas, I have better pictures that can show this. Let me see if I have it here. That's it. So these are the contact points that get inserted into the brain, okay? So there used to be four contact points, okay? But now they've taken, they've broken down four contact points, this one contact point, and they broke it into two, three different segments. This is the new leads uh, that uh, Abbott or St. Jude are implanting, which shows better control if people have side effects, okay? But DBS itself is kind of a newer technology, but the latest one that the ABOT has come is with the segmented lead, which if you ever come or you have questions, I can explain this more to you. Okay, that's number one. And the other company now, uh, Medtronic, has beta wave technology that is a very new technology. We can't kind of comprehend all the information that's giving us right now, but when you plant this lead, when you start stimulating the brain, the brain sends out a response. It's called a beta wave. So eventually within the next few hundred years, we can use the beta wave that the brain creates and respond to stimulations to modulate how well are we really stimulating that area. So they're using the beta wave. They're now beginning to record the beta wave for us to be able to process how well are we stimulating the brain and how good response we're going to get. I think in the next uh, couple decades, we're going to have more information on this. So part, who are the good candidates for these kind of implants? People who have early motor fluctuations, okay, and people who have dyskinesias, excessive body movements, okay, and they have basically wearing off. The carbidopa is not lasting long enough. You have to respond to carbidopa, okay? in order for you to get these kind of DBS or the brain implants. And this shows how after the implant, 
the, basically the medication is lasting longer and there is not as much off time. The whole goal of treating Parkinson's patient is when you take a medication, you're on, I mean, you're moving, you're doing well. But after two or three hours, the medication starts wearing off and you're no longer functioning well. So everything we do as a Parkinson specialist is to prolong the efficacy of the medication and make sure you're on and you're functioning for longer period of time. And DBS does that because after a while, the carbidopa may not work as well. Okay, so you implant these electrodes so you can increase the prolonged efficacy of the dopamine, the carbidopa, the pills you take. Also, you may get that increased efficacy at a reduced amount of medication. That's one of the benefits. And uh, there are some side effects. Some people have cognitive problems. Some people have psychiatric problems. These are the numbers, like two out of 300 people may have some cognitive decline. Psychiatric symptoms, some people may develop depression. That's one out of 300 people. The risk of infections are very low and the battery needs to be replaced every few years. So the battery comes in your chest and they they replace it every few years. Okay, this was the picture. These, the leads go in the brain, they tunnel the wires behind your ear and they put it in your chest. It's just like a pacemaker. And then I put a device on the battery and adjust it, okay? What happened is there is, there is a positive and there is a negative. The positive and negative for those of you guys who have some electrical engineering or physics background creates a magnetic field. This magnetic field modulates the neurons and the environment around it to conduct more efficiently. We still don't know exactly why that happens. Okay, when I started fellowship, I thought it was because of neurons were like wires, they conducted electricity. It changed the conduction of the electrical flow in the neurons. That's actually not fully correct. It changes the neurons environment, what's in the cell, the electrodes, the chemicals in the cell, which allows better conduction. So it's still controversial. They're still doing some research on it. It's one of my kind of areas that occasionally I look up and see what's the latest thing that has come out. So these are, there is a subthalamic. Usually you do a subthalamic. These are one of the, the first article that came out. And then there's also now, I know some of you guys are gonna have some questions about um, the new one that is basically they, um, it's they use they use a what is it called they use a system to um, burn the nucleus okay um, I don't know what the name is escaping my mind right now that's another one that they're using right now and uh, we can discuss that if anybody has a question on that um, this is the deep brain stimulator the other one that's new is duopa duopa gets uh, connected it's a it's a j tube it goes not in your stomach it goes in the uh, in the not in the duodenum and it's actually, it's actually the lower part of the duodenum and then there it's a gel the dopamine is a gel that's excreted into basically the first part of the duodenum okay because that's the that's where the most of the carbidopa is uh, effectively absorbed. And in people who have some kind of, uh, basically they've been on dopamine for a long time, after a while, the stomach mucosa and the duodenum mucosa, they're no longer absorb dopamine effectively. So this is the best way of releasing dopamine into the cells. And this is, the, there, this is another new technology that we're using. It's called an African pump. When I was at Loma Linda before COVID broke out, we were still doing trials on this. I had a couple of patients. This is transdermal. It has a tiny needle that sticks out, very tiny. You put it on your skin and the needle pierces the skin. And it, transdermally, it releases some of the medications called the, uh, called basically it's apomorphine. Apokin, um, is an injector that we use in people who have time off, wear off very quickly, okay? And we use that sometimes in, it's called an, it's called Apokin. We would inject it between when the medication was wearing off during the off time, okay? But now they've made this into a continuous gel, as you can see with the syringe here that once you install it, it gradually gradually releases the medication under the skin and you have better efficacy. So there are a couple of questions. Um, 
latest experiments and drugs and procedure, nilotinibin, it's a tyrannist kinase inhibitor that they're doing trials on, okay? Some, some, some centers are doing experiments on transcranial magnetic stimulation that also has been shown some efficacy in Parkinson's disease. However, these are not FDA approved yet, okay? And uh, I am coming to the end of my slide, but if you have more questions, I'll be more than happy to answer because I know people are gonna have some questions about um, basically um, stem cells and things like that. Do you have any questions? Do you want me to go into that topics yet? A lot of it are, are experimental and it's being conducted at John Hopkins with extraction of the pluripotent stem cells. They, they don't have any good clinical trials yet, but what they're doing is they're extracting stem cells from your own cells and they're growing it and they're creating neurons and they're implanting this. There has been a couple uh, similar experiments, um, I think at Cornell also with some, some efficacy, but however, it's not open to the public yet completely. There are other medications too. Again, these are just came out um, that are not in the slides. I, how many of you guys have heard of Riteri? Riteri is a longer acting carbidopa, okay? That is used, that is used on the, it's basically a version of this carbidopa. Let me come back to the basic slide. That's why I have this slide. So most of the medications are categorized as dopamine compt or other agents. So this other medication is, is Riteri is a form of the levidopa or the carbidopa. This is a better slide because it's very easier. This is Riteri that I mentioned earlier in this, uh, in, earlier in the discussion. And Riteri is a newer version of the carbidopa that is in a capsule mixed with beads. These are cellulose beads or special beads that slow down the release of the dopamine. And it doesn't open in your stomach, so there's no sudden surge. It opens in the small intestine, so it absorbs a little bit more slowly. And that's why it has slower peaks and lasts a little bit longer, okay? There is a new medication in the category of the COMP inhibitors. It's called Ogentis. Ogentis is a once-a-day pill, like Tolcapone or Entacapone, where three or four times a day pills. Ogentis is a once-a-day pill. And then there is another medication. This is a completely new medication. It works through the ADP system at the cell. It's called Neurions. It's a Japanese company that made this. And Neurions sometimes makes the tremors less. Um, and uh, it's not on this slide because it just came out about a year ago. And Neurions has some efficacy. I like some of the efficacies that I've seen. I think I'm going to open this to discussion. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer some of your questions. Let me see if I can exit the slides. Yes, and we do show. actually have several questions. So I've been categorizing those. So um, there were a couple actually in regards to Ritari. So I yeah. will, since you mentioned those recently, I'll go back to those. So um, in the treatment plan, one of the questions was, at what point does Riteri fit? Like, who, when would Riteri be considered appropriate as opposed to traditional immediate release? So traditional immediate, immediate release should last about four hours, okay? So if, if it's not lasting four hours, then I would say you need to switch to Riteri because Riteri usually lasts an extra one or two hours. Some people start starting to use Riteri immediately. I don't do that yet, okay? Because I wanna use the traditional first. Once the traditional fails, I wanna have something else to use. So that's when I use, start to use Riteri, okay? That's the way I do it. But people are a little bit different on how to use it. The theory is if the carbidopa you use lasts longer, it's always better for the neuron. Okay, because the neuron doesn't want to see too much fluctuation. It likes to see a steady supply of the dopamine. Now, however, I still like the old classic medication carbidopa best, especially in people I diagnose early on, because I want to see if they have efficacy, if they 
they respond to it immediately because the response to Riteri is always a little bit slower but lasts longer than the carbidopa. So just to recap what I said, if the carbidopa doesn't last more than three to four hours, then I would use Riteri because Riteri definitely will last longer than the regular carbidopa. And that goes to this question. If Is there a max dosage of Raitari per day? Can you vary the dosage of it so that you attempt to have larger doses just prior to a known off period? So they go based on the max dose for carbidopa. So the max dose for carbidopa is about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. You can give three times that in Raitari. And the reason is you absorb about a third of the Raitari dosage. Okay, so it's, it's, that's the basic ballpark we go by. But everybody is different, you guys. Some people hallucinate with half that dose. Some people, I've broken that rule and I've given them 1,400 milligrams of carbidopa and they're still doing fine without any adverse effect. Individual matters. It, it's everybody is unique. But the answer to the question is up to three times the regular carbidopa. And the regular carbidopa is about 1,000 to 1,200. So it can go up to 3,600 a day on right area. Someone wrote in um, and said, England has approved the delivery of a carbidopa levodopa via a nasal spray because more of the med can get through the blood brain barrier. Do you know what the status of this in the US? I don't know of that, but I know another company that creates this and it's FDA approved and it's available in my office. It's called Embrea. It's the nasal form of the carbidopa. These medications you have to understand are for an off time period. You have to have a medications that you take on a regular basis to sustain you. That if you do extra activity and you have wearing off quicker, meaning that the medication stops working, then Embraer comes into place. It's a nasal spray. You spray it, you inhale it. It gives you a boost of dopamine. That is that is present in the U.S. I don't know exactly what Great Britain is offering right now, but there is an inhaler form that I have, Embraer, that is used in the U.S. And you're more than welcome to come see me. I'll, I'll try it out if you want. In regards to our friends across the pond, um, somebody had asked, "Can you tell more? Can you tell more about the Intacapone? Why is this not sold in Europe?" So, so it goes because both of directions. Liver, no, no, it's it's a very valid question. So we were doing we were doing a trial on a new form of Intacapone. Okay, but what happened is just like the all the other Intacapone, it caused liver failure, and the trial was pulled off of Loma Linda. This was about a year when I was at Loma Linda. Okay, the only one that has remained to be safe, uh, that is generic, is entacapone. That has that it's still there is a risk of liver problem, but it's not as high. Okay, so that has still remained in the U.S. market, and then Ogentis, it's the newest one that has just entered the market about a year ago, and that seems to be safe because I haven't heard anything. But what they're doing is basically stating, they're taking the safe uh, comp that doesn't cause too much liver problem, they're making it extended release. So you take only one pill a day, okay? So that's, that's basically, to answer your question again, is because of the fear of liver problem. It does have a tendency to cause liver failure. That's why there's limited supply in the US. US is very cautious with the medication that it gives. It's not like other countries. All right, so one, someone asked about, uh, is there promise using exosomes? Yes, I know where you're going with this. Yes, but the technology is not advanced enough yes, yet to do it. Um, I don't wanna say too much because I need to read more about it. I know about it, but I don't know enough to teach other people about it. But yes, because I heard, I've heard recently that they're using this technology also in some of some forms of muscle disorders, or they're flying, they're trying to do use it in some form of muscle disorders um, and other genetic disorders. Yes, but we I don't know yet to what extent. Yes, I believe in it. Yeah. 
Someone asked about whether there's some new research or any other observations regarding the microbiome of vegetarian diet and Parkinson's. This is a very good question, which I always read about when I can, because I was trained by Catherine Fry, who actually was a big believer in Brock's hypothesis. And Brock's hypothesis talk about how uh, the bacterial flora in your gut, it actually could be the reason why, or your food, what you ingest, may be the reason why you may develop Parkinson's disease, okay? However, nobody has come out with a real diet that suggests might be superior to another diet in preventing or slowing down Parkinson's disease. But I've noticed something, it might be my own personal bias that it might be less in the Middle East. So the Middle Eastern diet, they always encourage it with olive and olive oil and uh, uh, cheese and all that stuff might be better, but nobody really knows. It's something that I'm curious with. Coconut oil is also very good, okay? And a couple of people have studied some stuff on cashews and avocados that those, they have fatty acids that also might be very good. Nobody really knows, but people believe, and I believe also that diet has to do, has, has something to do with this because when you scan the brain, these abnormal amyloid protein that are formed, they're not only in the brain, they're in the brainstem, lower part of the brain. And they believe that these abnormal proteins are started around the neurons that innervate the gut. So something enters the gut, then enters the neurons that surround the gut, and it hops into the nerve plexus that are around the gut, which go to the spinal cord, and from the spinal cord into the goes to the brainstem and goes up the brain. And I'm sure there is going to be a variant of Parkinson's disease that's gonna be discovered in the few hundred years from now that has to do with this pathway. I think there is no one form of Parkinson's disease, if you ask me. I think there are many variants, and I think one form of it has to do with the diet. But there is no clear that I like. Probiotics is good, but most people start it when they already have the disease. And nobody knows what probiotic is good, what's bad, because you're dealing with millions and billions, as they advertise, of different, basically, bacteria that are used in that little bottle. So nobody has done systematic trials to see what's good, but eat good food, eat healthy food. I am an, I'm a strict believer in that, okay? But nobody really knows. All right. And one person asked, how do you distinguish between what is Parkinson's, other comorbidities and aging? So Parkinson's is very, it has to have stiffness, slowness, tremor, and basically freezing on abnormal ga gait with loss of arm movement, arm swing movement. And it's mostly unilateral, okay? That's what defines Parkinson's disease. Better than that, if it's true Parkinson's, you give them medication, the patient gets better. That's what the, that is what true Parkinson's is. But becoming old and aging, we're all gonna have some of those problems because of age, degenerative joint disease, spine disease, back disease, okay? But for Parkinson's disease, it's the stiffness, tremor, slowness, okay? And postural problems plus response to carbidopa. Then you know somebody has Parkinson's disease and one side has to be worse than other. That's typically what Parkinson's is like, okay? So that's a good segue into if there's anything that is new or specific for PSP. That's a very good question because it's it's a very unfortunate area. There is nothing good or new for PSP, but we're using whatever comes out in for Parkinson's patients, we're using it to treat PSP. Neoplasid has worked on PSP patients a little bit. In some form of PSP patients, carbidopa does work, but the reality of it, we don't have anything good for PSP. Now, unfortunately, I have to say no, but whatever comes out for Parkinson's, I always try it for my PSP patients. And some of my PSP patients do get some benefits from it. One of it being Riteri. If you haven't tried Riteri, 
definitely try Raiteru with PSB because there is nothing to lose. Okay. All right. Um, I have several questions in regards to DBS and a question about the focus ultrasound, but there was one question. Yeah, yeah, focus that, ultrasound. Yeah, oh God. I was, yes, that was what it was. Of, oh my God. I <laughs> but can't I didn't want to interfere. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm so happy you said that because I don't know why. It's so UCLA does it and Dr. Devin Binder do it. Okay. And it's, it's a, I'm just going to give you, I give you my feedback. I think for certain kind of situation, it's excellent. But for other kind of situations, DBS is better because DBS, you can continually modulate it, change it, program it, reprogram it. But when you do focus ultrasound ablation, you can't. It's just one, bam, you zoom zap, you're done. There is no modulation. If you ask me, I have a preference for DBS because I can continually modulate it and nothing gets destroyed, okay? But there are certain cases that the patient is too old, has too many comorbidity, comorbidities, can't have a surgery, you see? But the focused ultrasound ablation is, is they don't open anything. It's just a focused ultrasound and they do it and it, patients do respond. They do tend to get better. So it's, it's based on the individual situation. You can't say one thing is better than another one. Is you have to wait and see what's good for you, okay? And you mentioned age, and somebody did ask specifically, how old is too old for DBS? Is there an age cutoff? There is no age cutoff. There is a cognition cutoff. And there, how depends how healthy your lungs and heart are. Because if something happens and you have to be intubated, they have to see if you're going to come out of that intubation. If somebody puts a tube and the machine breathes for you, are you able to come out of it? If you have heart failure, or if you have respiratory problems or COP, they may not do the surgery because if they need to intubate you, then that's gonna be a problem. But this is usually a surgery that you're awake the entire time, but people have a tendency of looking at worst case scenario. But again, it's an individual situation. I, I've known people who said, yes, I wanna do it. I don't care about the risk. They sign a consent and they get it done. But, but most of the time it's the cognition. You have to have a mini mental or psychiatric exam done and if you're not within the normal range of the mini mental status or the MOCA exam, they tend not to do it because they have to insert these electrodes through the frontal lobe, which can cause a lowering of your dementia and cognition. So that's the risk of it, to be honest with you. I'm a big, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of DBS. But when the time is right, you have to cater it to the individual. Right. So let's go into that a little bit deeper. So can you talk a little bit more about when treatment for DBS is appropriate, what symptoms does it manage specifically, and what, who would be a good candidate? So I know you touched on this briefly. So, no, no, I will, I will re summarize it. So if you break mm -hmm. Parkinson's disease, is three stages, early, middle, and late. You want to do DBS in the middle stage. And people fall in that middle stage when typically the medication starts to wear off after like two or three hours. It doesn't last four to five hours. You see what I'm saying? You've tried Riteri. Riteri pushed DBS implant a little bit further because now there is Riteri and we give them Riteri and it works a little bit better. But Riteri also wears down after a couple of years sometimes. But the other thing is that if you give them too much medication and they develop adverse reaction of the medication, some, some people develop dyskinesias, which is abnormal movement. Some people have a lot of tremor. The medications don't do much for the tremor. So in those cases who develop dyskinesias or have excess tremor, DBS is absolutely better than anything else, as long as they don't have dementia or cognitive problems. So you don't want to wait too long to implant DBS. If it's mild, moderate, severe, you want to go for early, moderate, or mid-moderate stage in patients who have excessive dyskinesias and they're not tolerating the medications well, and, or they have a lot of tremors. Those are the patients you have, you go for DBS, the way I do it. And most people do what I do basically, yeah. And you mentioned earlier, um, we know that there's now three different technologies for DBS. Can you briefly touch on the differences between the three? The three, I don't know about three, I know about two. One is made by Medtronic, which is the one lead with four contact points. Okay, let me see. I have a pen here. 
Okay. So each company. Let's talk about maybe the three com companies if there's the, a difference. No, there is not much of a difference. The, each one of them have their own benefits. So this is a discussion that's complicated. Okay. Medtronics, Medtronic has its own benefit and then they have the new beta wave technology, which records the response of the brain to the implant and your programming. Okay. St. Saint, uh, Saint Jude or Abbott um, has a new technology with segmented lead that the leads have different contact points. So you can focus the energy better. It's not, it's, it, it, somebody has to look at like, for example, if you have more of problem with your voice and speech, somebody might go with Abbott because you can focus the energy better to avoid the speech areas. It, it's a very individualized question. You have to talk with your physician, but each of them have their own benefits. Um, the lead, for example, if you're an active guy, you may want to go with Abbott because their leads are more springy. So if you move around and you're jogging, there's a less chance of a lead breakage, but they're coming out with another form of leads uh, too that might be beneficial. The batteries, I believe, I think both of them are now MRI compatible. There was one company, I think Medtronic batteries were MRI compatible. I have to look into this again, because they told me they're both of them now have MRI compatible batteries. That's another one, because if you might need MRIs down the line, you may pick one company over the other. I mean, it's a very, it's an individual question. You have to in, see the individual patient and their needs, and then you know what company might be the best. Okay. There is no right or wrong. Yeah. All right. Well, we are just a few minutes out towards the end. I got a couple more questions for you. Sure. Um, one is in regards to your slide on Duopa that it mentioned dementia. And their question was, does that mean that it causes dementia? Um, and I think it was those maybe that was more indicated for, such as they wouldn't be appropriate for DBS maybe. I think would, that might Would you be. repeat that question, please? I'm sorry. You had the slide in regards to Duopa and you had, um, on their dementia and they wanted to know does that mean that it causes dementia no 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 it was i that is a safest new and innovative thing for people with dementia who cannot get dps implanted you see what i'm saying that is the safest thing for people with dementia because people who have dementia they regardless of what company you go to they're not going to have dbs because both companies the leads have to be implanted in your frontal cortex so that there's a risk of exacerbating your cognition or cognitive decline. So Duopa, the tube goes in your stomach, has nothing to do and the surgery is much less invasive because it's just the tube in your stomach, it's not brain surgery. So people who have dementia, my bad, I need to review my slides, um, is it's they're better off sometimes doing the Duopa. That's what that slide meant. Gotcha. All right, um, this person wants to know if there's a daytime influence on Parkinson's symptoms, such as having exaggerated anxiety and pain during the same time, like a two hour time span daily, usually after their medication dose. That's, that can be because of the medication. You have to try a lower dose of the medication, okay? But it depends what other medications you want. Sometimes you may have to reduce the adjuncts because the adjuncts boost, this, boost the neurochemicals. So again, it, I, have to, I have to know what the individual situation is. It's difficult to answer, but try reducing the medication and see if you feel better. Okay. And then one last question is regarding sure. off time. And their question is, can you just take more carbidopa, leave a double one off? So yes, if it's an isolated incidence once or twice a week, okay? But no, if it's a regular incident, because if you're off and you take extra doses, you're pushing the pushing this up and down, pushing, pushing the levels up. And then the neurons don't like that because if there is too much sudden fluctuations, then you develop the dyskinesias and the abnormal movement that goes with the poor medication intake and poor medical management. Okay. So occasionally, yes. Okay. Occasionally, yes, but not regularly. Okay. Occasionally, yes, but not regularly. All right. Well, I think that is all we have time for in terms of questions. I want to thank you so much for you guys are more than welcome joining in and for <laughs> all of the wonderful questions we've had from everyone today. It's been very informative. 
Um, if everyone wants to give their gratitude to Dr. Pedwin for joining us and sharing this information, given the wave of gratitude, Doctor, we thank you so much for giving oh us your God. time it, today. It was a great show. I didn't think after Memorial Day so many people would be here. It was fun having so many people. Very good. Nice meeting everyone. Very good. Thank uh, you. We thank you, and we hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining us. We will see you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you right. so much. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.